Um, Putin is the worst. I mean, Putin has, has done everything possible up to, but not um, starting a nuclear war. Um, nothing could be worse. Um, I, I can say that definitively. Um, having, having said that, uh, if Putin were to die in his sleep tonight, um, there's so much economic interest. There's a trillion dollars of money that's been stolen from Russia that belongs to the thousand Putin and the thousand people around him. Putin started this war for one very simple and important reason, which is that he had stolen too much money from the Russian people. And if um, uh, time were to sort of take uh, time and events were to take their course, then the Russian people would eventually unthrown him to kick him out of his position. And in in that circumstance, um, he would lose all his money, he would go to jail, and he would probably die. Um, <clears throat> good things don't happen to former dictators in that part of the world. So he needs to be at war in order um, to survive, physically survive. So, but I remember us talking probably a year or two ago, and you predicted rightly this would be a long war against Ukraine. You saw uh, that Putin's life depended on it. He'd staked everything on this kind of uh, victory and that he would not back down. So before we get to the larger strategic implications of that, particularly on the Russian economy and the war in Ukraine, I'm just wondering what you made of the latest indictments. There were two indictments and also a, a set of sanctions against um, RT employees who were funding to the ten, tune of $10 million, uh, super spreader influences in the US, and also this doppelganger network directly reporting the social design agency, directing directly reporting to the president. Now, you've written two books. You've been a target of disinformation and even arrested under that red notice. Do you see an evolution of the techniques of the Kremlin since, let's say, 2016, and Evgeny Prigozhin's famous troll farm. Um, I, I think that, that first and foremost, um, <clears throat> we should sort of go back to the basics. Um, Putin started this war for one very simple and important reason, which is that he had stolen too much money from the Russian people. And if um, uh, time were to sort of take, uh, time and events were to take their course, then the Russian people would eventually unthrown him to kick him out of his position. And in in that circumstance, um, he would lose all his money, he would go to jail, and he would probably die. Um, <clears throat> good things don't happen to former dictators in that part of the world. And Putin, who is not a stupid man, understood very clearly that in order for him to stay alive, he needed to stay in power. Now, how do you stay in power when you basically have robbed all the resources of your country from your people and kept them for yourself and about a thousand people around you? And the answer is you create a foreign enemy. You, you redirect people's angers, anger away from you towards that foreign enemy and you start a war. And Putin has a history of starting wars when his popularity is flagging. In fact, he became the president of Russia by starting a war in Chechnya. In 2008, he started a war in Georgia in his popularity, which was flagging Rose. In 2014, he started the war by taking Crimea. And of course, in 2022, he started this full-scale invasion. So he needs to be at war in order um, to survive, physically survive. So then... <clears throat> You have to say to yourself, well, this war hasn't gone as well as he was hoping. He thought that this war would be a three-day war. It's now two and a half years in. 600,000 dead Russian soldiers, hundreds of billions of dollars of damage um, to his economy, hundreds of billions of dollars of damage to the Ukraine economy, $300 billion of Russian reserves frozen. It's total um, physical and economic disaster for him. And so... Um, uh, one one way, one possible way for him to end this war is to find, um, is to basically get the United States to stop funding Ukraine. Well, how does he do that? Um, there are two candidates for the presidential election in November. Um, one candidate, Kamala Harris, will be a status quo candidate 
as far as Ukraine goes, and we'll continue funding Ukraine. And the second candidate, Donald Trump, is a candidate who has indicated that he would cut off economic support for Ukraine and military support for Ukraine. Well, guess what? <laughs> That's the preferred candidate for Vladimir Putin. Um, so he, he could either spend hundreds of billions of dollars more to um, uh, uh, have uh, in destruction and military spending, or he could spend tens of millions of dollars in supporting Donald Trump. And so guess what? That's exactly what he did. And um, the, the, the tip of the iceberg has been exposed, which is this $10 million payment um, to a firm in Tennessee that was supporting all sorts of, of um, pro-Russia, anti-Ukraine, right-wing uh, MAGA uh, uh, positions. Um, and that's the tip of the iceberg, and surely there's more. But what you need to understand is that this whole information war that's being conducted is much, much, much cheaper than the um, physical war. And so, of course, he's going to spend money doing it. And so coming back to your question, how does this vary or, or look relative to 2016? Well, I think it was proven in 2016 that, um, uh, that the, the Russians, that Putin supported Donald Trump and, and did so with all sorts of, of, of Facebook and Twitter and other types of things. Um, that was run by Yevgeny Prigozhin and his troll factories in St. Petersburg. And now we're in a much more precarious situation as far as Putin is concerned. And he's spending much, much more. And he has the um, total support of one of the social media platforms, which is uh, Twitter, um, or now known as X. And then he has the support of, of various um, underlings of Donald Trump. And he's got the support of Donald Trump. And and by sort of mixing and matching and, and amplifying all this type of stuff, Putin is hoping that somewhere in this process, um, he can pick up an extra 40 to 80,000 uh, voters for Trump in a few narrow swing states, and then he'll get what he wants, which is a cutoff of funding for Ukraine. And the bonus that Trump has also said that he's not too happy about being involved in NATO, which is another one of Putin's total fantasies is to is to have NATO disintegrate. And so there's a hell of a lot at stake here. This indictment is very important. Um, and the situation is very grave. Bill, what a brilliant analysis. We might just point out that uh, a couple of days ago, Vladimir Putin said he was supporting Kamala Harris. This is very much in the KGB line as a, of distract, divert. And all the Russian commentators on Russian TV are just laughing at this. Now, just going back briefly to 2016, because a lot of these influences, some of them now proved to being paid by the Kremlin, was saying Russiagate was a hoax, the Mueller inquiry was a hoax. We know, don't we, that while Robert Mueller could not prove collusion, that that was the major basis of the investigation, that Trump had knowingly incited and used Russian information operations. There's no doubt they happened. There was 50 million spent on Prigozhin's troll farm. They named the Facebook sites. They named the operatives. So, but have we been sleeping for the last, what is it now, yeah, five, sorry, seven years? Or do you think this proves, in little details you can see in the indictment, for example, with Tenet, they've been looking at RT and their influencing and funding for two years. Um, there was talk in the other indictment, the doppelganger indictment, of 2,800 influencers they were seeking to approach or use that actually, across the Atlantic, we see in France the arrest of the founder of Telegram, the security services, law enforcement is much more advanced and looking at this threat in a way it wasn't in 2016-17. Well, I, I think that, that um, uh, Russia has advanced its technologies since 2016 and uh, the West has advanced its reactions to those technologies since 2016. I mean, the fact that, that um, here we are um, in September um, before the election, and we're not asleep at the wheel. The Department of Justice just indicted uh, a number of individuals. And by the way, this is not to mention they um, they've also indicted Dimitri Symes, who is a, uh, uh, a a former advisor to Rand Paul, who um, for for um, uh, who is taking money and violating sanctions, et cetera, according to their indictment. Um, uh, there, there is all sorts of um, stuff going on um, in the. Department of Justice and the 
national security community in various places in France, going after Pavel Durov. Uh, you know, the, the, the way we have to think about this is that, um, you know, Twitter and Facebook and all these other things are not allowed to be um, operable in Russia. <laughs> he doesn't allow them. As, as, and the Chinese don't and the Iranians don't. All the bad guys have cut this stuff out. We have open societies. We're allowing these these um, uh, organizations to flourish and Russia and China and Iran are taking advantage of them. And for anyone who's like flapping about saying, oh, this is a violation of free speech, they need to understand that national security trumps free speech when it comes to this type of thing. We can't allow Putin to become a uh, leader of the world and um, and destroying all of our security um, in, in some some fantasy that that um, it should be OK for Elon Musk to allow um, Putin operated um, uh, bots to infect um, the voter uh, consciousness of people in, in Wisconsin. That, that's just it's paradoxical. It's a bit like Maria Butina and the NRA pushing for more people to have guns in the US when nobody individuals allowed to have them in Russia. And just worth pointing out about Elon Musk. He talks about free speech, but he has willingly cooperated with authoritarian governments, including Saudi Arabia, by handing over data people have been executed. OK, so you've talked very eloquently about this escalating hybrid warfare, this non-kinetic information warfare, and it's, you know, it's escalating, as you, as you say. So, but what you describe about Putin, his moves to protect himself from prison and death, they are escalating too. And they're not succeeding, are they? I mean, you, you rightly predicted this war would go on for years. But what are the signs of the Russian economy that with taxes raising, with the sanctions not completely sealed, there are many people who bypass the sanctions, that the war is beginning to cost him. There are bombings, you know, Kursk, parts of the Kursk Oblast have been taken over. There are drones arriving in Moscow. No doubt the conscription and the mobilization will affect the children of the middle classes and the elite. What do you see of the trajectory within Russia, a place you know well, um, with Putin's strategy of escalation? What, what you need to understand is that it's not going as well as Putin. The economy is not going as well as Putin wants us to believe. He, he wants us to believe everything is fine, all good. Sanctions aren't working. Why bother with sanctions? They're hurting you. Um, therefore, we should all just, um, you know, get back to normal. That's his pitch to us. Sanctions are causing him incredible pain. $300 billion of central bank reserves have been frozen. Russia can't borrow anywhere in the international capital markets. Um, 600,000 able-bodied young men are dead. Another million have fled the country um, to avoid being one of those dead people. Um, a thousand Western companies have pulled out. Uh, uh, an enormous amount of, of Western technology is unavailable, and therefore planes can no longer fly and, and factories can no longer operate. It's a total mess over there. And so for anyone to say, oh, it's all going fine, it might be going fine in the center of Moscow, but I promise you it's not going fine overall. And so the, the Russian people are, are not, um, you know, feeling pretty, they're not feeling all that great about it. And, and of course, the, the part of Kursk region of Russia has now been occupied by the Ukrainians. Um, uh, oil refineries are blowing up. Um, they're, they're rationing gasoline in, in Russia. It's, it's really a, ugly. And now Putin's original promise to the Russian people was that um, the chaos of the pre-Putin era was going to be eliminated um, in exchange you, you, you get better a better economic future. Just don't don't put your nose into politics. And for a long time, people said, yeah, I don't care about politics as long as I can like buy a car next year and go on a trip to Turkey or whatever it is they wanted to do. But now everybody is is uh, hurting economically. Um, they're they're um, uh, hurting in all sorts of different ways. And Putin um, doesn't have that thing to offer them. And so as time goes on, all he can do is just seem like more and more of a strong man, repress more and more in all sorts of ways. Now, now, if you if you're in Russia and you even mutter the word war, instead of calling it a special military operation, which is somehow his spin that it's not, you know, a war, um, you go to jail for eight years. I mean, eh, um, my, my friend Vladimir Karamurza, who thankfully was just um, released in the prisoner swap on August 1st, he, he had criticized Putin and was sentenced to 25 years in jail. That shows a man who's scared to death of his own people. And what that shows is that 
as time goes on, as the situation gets worse for Russia, um, uh, Putin has to repress more and more. He no longer has the carrot. All he has is the stick. And the more he represses, the more likely it is that that something breaks, that something blows. You know, it's like a pressure cooker. You need to somehow release the pressure. But um, there's no way to release the pressure because the release of the pressure is better economics and he can't offer that to people. And so he's in a situation where the pressure gets greater and greater. And one of two things can happen. It can blow or it could carry on. And I, I would argue that, that the probability is it probably carries on because we've seen multiple generations of the Kims in, in, uh, in, in uh, North Korea. And we saw Mubarak for 35 years. It's more likely than not that a repressive dictator somehow stays in control of it. But that doesn't mean that it's a 0% probability that the whole thing blows because nobody can predict it. You know, so Mubarak was dictator in Egypt for 35 years, and one day it all blew. Um, and the same thing with Gaddafi, and the same thing with um, uh, Yanukovych in Ukraine. And I mean, and so, you know, for, for every dictator that's lasted multi-decades, there's also dictators where the whole thing blows. Nobody knows the probability. Putin doesn't know. The one thing I will predict is that as time goes on, he's in, or, in order for him to stay in power and stay alive, the re repressions in Russia are going to get worse and worse because that's all he has left. And you're also going to see um, uh, that they're going to have to draft, uh, have a general conscription of young men in order to replenish the troops that are getting killed a thousand a day on the front line. And so as time goes on, it, it, anything could happen. And, and that, that, is the, um, th that, that, that is our hope, is that anything will happen in a way that, that, um, where Putin is not the winner. Um, but what Putin is hoping and banking on is that he can outlast us. That he can wait. That that he wins in November uh, with Trump. Um, that that um, Germany, the AFD, comes into power. That in France, Marine Le Pen comes into power, and somehow, um, you know, with all of all of the budget problems everyone's having in the West, that we somehow just can't afford to carry on. And so it's it's um, it's a really a battle of wills, battle of time. Um, Putin is bearing a hundred times more pain than we are, um, but he but he doesn't care about the pain because. It's not, actually, it's not actually pain for him. It's pain for his people. And he doesn't care about his people. He doesn't care how many die, how many. All he wants to do is make sure that they don't rise up and, and dethrone him. Bill, it's always brilliant talking to you because your analysis, both of the nature of the regime and Putin's personality is so astute. Just picking up those comparisons with Egypt, Mubarak and the Kim family in North Korea. Obviously, um, Putin has made bigger enemies of uh, the West, key partners in the EU and the US. Um, he has friends in the global South, of course, but he has provoked more than I'd say those other regimes. Is there something else that is a factor here? I was in Ukraine a couple of weeks ago in Odessa in the front line in Kherson, and it's conf I haven't been back since the Maidan revolution. Um, you, well, he will not be able, he can slowly kill them and destroy their cities. He will never occupy the whole of Ukraine. It would take him, it's just an impossible time. He'd have to kill everybody, wouldn't he? Well, I mean, uh, the, the, the Soviet Union couldn't occupy Afghanistan. Um, it, it, even if they had won the war in three days as Putin, that was his fantasy, they would have an insurgency that would eventually lead to the whole thing coming undone anyways. And so they're not going to get Ukraine. He doesn't even want Ukraine. All he wants is to be at war. And, and that's the big problem. If he somehow were able to, like, you know, quote, get Ukraine and, um, uh, uh, and install a Russian friendly government, then he needs another war to carry on to keep him in power. And that would probably be a war with with the Baltics or with Poland or something like that. And therefore, you know, it's, it's hugely in our interest in the West to prevent that because those countries are NATO allies. And we either have a treaty obligation to then go to war directly with Russia or we abandon our treaty obligation and Putin takes over all of Eastern Europe. Either way, this is a much better deal to have Ukrainians fighting him off than us fighting him off. I mean, I want to get briefly towards the end back to the UK and the Russia report people always mention to me. But before we do that, um, Putin isn't immortal, uh, no matter how much Botox or plastic surgery he has uh, and reportedly has some medical conditions. What I'm often told, um, you know, by experts is, well, you know, this is the Western strategy of containment. Don't escalate because Russia may fall apart and you get somebody worse with nukes. 
I do you see any succession possibilities? It's not like maybe Medvedev, but there don't seem to be anybody in the lineup to take over his role should he retire or you know leave the Kremlin in a box. What do you see the possibilities to replace Putin, and would they be worse? No, um, Putin is the worst, and Putin has has done everything possible up to, but not um, starting a nuclear war. Um, nothing could be worse. Um, I, I can say that definitively. Um, having having said that, uh, if Putin were to die in his sleep tonight, um, there's so much economic interest. There's a trillion dollars of money that's been stolen from Russia that belongs to the thousand Putin and the thousand people around him. And and if if there was some kind of like uncontrolled change of of strategy, um, the new people would come in and want to take the money away from the old people, and therefore the um, there's a huge economic interest in all of the elite who has all the money right now getting together in the in a criminal conclave in the Kremlin and then deciding on a leader who would control the situation and create the status quo. And then eventually they decide on that person and some black smoke would come out of the top of the Kremlin and they would denounce the new leader of Russia. That's how it would probably work. Um, it wouldn't be worse than Putin. Um, it probably wouldn't be better than Putin. The only way for leadership to change in Russia is if everybody in the current situation gets scared. And if you remember when Prigozhin was marching towards Moscow, um, it was remarkable if you watched flight radar, there were all these takeoffs of private jets from, from Moscow and St. Petersburg because um, all the elite thought that, you know, they're gonna get their head chopped off on Red Square and their, all their assets would be confiscated from their families. And so they wanted to get out. Um, and that's the way that it could happen. But the only way that that's going to happen is if there is a total collapse of confidence in the Kremlin Putin system. And that and the most likely that way that would happen is if the Ukrainians could actually achieve a military victory in Ukraine, where they where they push out Russian troops, where it just becomes unsustainable for Russia. And then people would in Russia would say, well, why have we suffered such a huge number of dead people? And why have we suffered um, so much economic hardship for this weak, stupid leader? We don't want them anymore. And then all those guys would get on their planes. And then then who knows who would take over? I, I was hoping that, that that Alexei Navalny would take over, but they, of course, killed him. Um, but there are other people like Alexei Navalny, people who are um, uh, uh, anti-corruption, you know, pro-democracy, pro-Europe, uh, uh, members of the opposition that, that still exist out there, a number of them, including my dear friend Vladimir Karamurza, who was re just released in the prisoner swap are out there, you know, waiting to step in in that situation. But again, I, I put a low probability on that um, because the status quo is usually how these things go. So one of the things that emerged um, out of these indictments, especially the fascinating um, documents by the Social Design Agency, again, they are an online operation that reported directly to the president's office, was to instill this nuclear psychosis. I don't know if you read that. And and people I respect and admire, journalists who write for Byline Times, one has said to me, well, look, let's be careful. We don't. The key thing is to avoid nuclear war. And so this has been part of his saber rattling, hasn't it? According to American defense officials, there's no sign of actually any use or preparation of use for nuclear weapons. But every time something happens, like a refinery is hit or a Western missile is used to strike Crimea, they do rattle this nuclear saber, don't they? They, they do. And, 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 that, and, you know, Jake Sullivan, the president's national security advisor, President Biden's national security advisor, has pretty much openly stated, he said, we don't want to, we want to give Ukrainians enough so that they can not lose, but not enough so they win because we're afraid of escalation and nuclear conflict. And, and that, that's just like waving a red flag to a bull. Putin only, um, uh, he only respects strength, not weakness. Um, and so you, you point weakness, and that's weakness saying that, that we're going to appease this dictator because we're afraid of something he might do. Um, that's, he just gets more aggressive that way. And so these people don't seem to understand that that's the psychology of Russia. And by the way, there's nothing insightful that I've just said. If you ask any smart Russian, they'll tell you the same thing. And that's what's been going on for centuries in Russia, not even not even decades, but centuries. That's that's how they they operate. And, and so um, and the thing I would say is that if Putin were to do this terrible nuclear attack on Ukraine, um, uh, that would be the end of Putin. Then he loses everybody. He loses China and India and the global south. 
he becomes completely and absolutely isolated. And there, and it couldn't be done without consequence. The West can't allow a country to attack another country with nuclear weapons without some consequence. Maybe not a nuclear response, but a but a devastating conventional response. And so I think Putin understands that if he does that, that's pretty much him over, game over. And so that's why he's not going to do it. But again, he's he he is um, if we, he is escalated by by weakness, not by strength. Very interesting. So I just wanted uh, to conclude to circle back round to the UK, this uh, slightly benighted country now removed from the EU, uh, of which you are now a, a knight of. Um, one, of the, one of the things that um, uh, has emerged, you know, in these indictments, I suspect there'll be more in the Mueller indictments in 2017-18, is an intense investigation of Russian influence operations, spying cyber attacks by the Americans. Um, I th- I, you, you know about the Russia report. I think maybe you submitted evidence to it. This was the Intelligence Services Committee, high-ranking committee uh, in Parliament under Dominic Grieve, who we regularly talk to at that point, which uh, amassed evidence of attempted Russian interference here. Um, but then Boris Johnson tried to suppress it. Uh, the chair changed, managed to get bits of it out, heavily redacted. Do you think... Um, that the Britain now is catching up. I mean, one of the things that emerged, even amidst the redacted report, was that British intelligence agencies, MI5, MI6, NCA, GCHQ, had never been tasked to look at this, partly because of the embarrassment of Brexit. And do you think that can change, or is this still a huge oversight? We have 2,800 influences in the world the Kremlin are looking at. Presumably, 800 were in America, presumably some are here. So are, is Britain still open to foreign interference? And is there anything a knight of the realm can do to rectify that? Well, I, I spend a great deal of my time um, working with members of parliament and, and working with the government, trying to get stiff in their backbone when it comes to um, taking a, a tough stand on Russia. I would say that the world has completely changed from 2016. Um, you know, Britain has is, is been leading, not lagging in terms of its overall um, position in support of Ukraine and against Putin. Um, Britain has uh, provided storm shadow missiles and tanks and training and various other things. Britain has opened up its homes to Ukrainian refugees. And so Britain is in a totally different place as far as uh, Russia is concerned. Having said that, law enforcement in Britain um, is completely um, emasculated, weak, and unable to do the types of investigations that the Department of Justice does in this type of in these in these types of situations, I would be very doubtful that we'll ever see a similar type of of uh, national crime agency investigation um, or a prosecution of of uh, Russian influencers in the UK. But I would also point out one thing, which is very interesting, is that Russia wants to influence situations where their influence will ha- make a difference. And and um, in the last election. Um, People were so um, discouraged by by the previous um, government that that la- labor was going to win no matter what, and so it wasn't like they could get involved in in uh, you know changing anything, and it, and it wasn't as if labor was going to be any different than than the conservatives. You know, back in the days when Jeremy Corbyn was the labor leader, he wanted to you know do something terrible in terms of capitulating to Russia, but um, Keir Starmer is not, um, I, I, there's no daylight between Keir Starmer and, and Rishi Sunak when it came to uh, Russia policy. And so it didn't really matter. Um, it wasn't worth investing the money. It, it is worth for the Russians investing the money in Germany, where the AFD is rising, or in France, where Marine Le Pen is rising. But in Britain, there's really not a lot of latitude. And that doesn't mean that there's not influencers around. That doesn't mean that there's, um, there's a whole, all sorts of different campaigns going on to get people off sanctions lists and so on. But but it's not a, a ripe territory to get amazing win for Putin to do the influence. Except there is evidence, especially given the connections of some of these influences like Tommy Robinson, Stephen Yaxi Lennon and Andrew Tate, that they probably amplified along with Elon Musk social divisions around the riots in the summer. I mean, that's one of the classic techniques, isn't it? Well, I, I think I think you're right about that. And, and I think that... Um, uh, you know, when 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 there's another election coming up, and and uh, you know the Reform Party is trying to split up their the support for for the Conservatives and so on and so forth, then there's plenty of of fertile ground to be had. But but it wasn't going to change anything this time around because Labour had such an incredible lead that that 
and Labour wasn't going to do anything different than, than the Conservatives when it came to Russia. Bill, as always, your insights are so global and you provide an amazing narrative of how these things work, particularly of the trajectory of Russia under Putin. Thanks so much for joining us. Byline, Frontline. Have a great weekend and see you very soon.